Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1522. Follow your childhood interests. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I'm revved up and very excited today because I'm talking to a guest who's calling in from across the pond near Birmingham in the UK, John Bentley. What an awesome name to have when you live in the UK. John Bentley joined the BBC's Top Gear program as a researcher. He went on to become the producer and executive producer of that hit TV show that we all know and love between 1987 and 1999. Top Gear. He produced other programs for the BBC, including The Cars, The Star, and in 2002, after time as a producer with ITV and the BBC Natural History Unit, he launched Fifth Gear for Channel 5 and produced the show until 2004 when he joined The Gadget Show as a presenter. This gave him the opportunity to indulge in another childhood passion, technology. He is now established as the program's main gadget reviewer, John writes for Amateur Photographer and has penned stories for numerous other publications. And in November in 2019, John wrote his first book titled Autopia, The Future of Cars that was published by Atlantic Books. And we're going to do a book giveaway for you Cars Yes subscribers. John has been so kind to offer a book to one of the Cars Yes subscribers. So if you want your name in the hat, go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button. I'll send you my free filler up book. And your name will be in the hat to win a copy of Autopia. That'll be cool. We'll be back in just a minute to talk with John. But first, a word from our valued sponsors that make this show possible. We'll be right back. Hey, Cars Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Covercraft. I've protected my vehicles with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft seat covers. They'll protect your seats from the daily abuse of pets, children, weekend adventures, and even those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. All Covercraft seat covers are easy-on, easy-off design that are machine washable. You can choose from many fabric options, colors, and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicles. Their seat gloves are semi-custom fit for cars and trucks, and their seat savers, a favorite of mine, are custom-tailored to fit your seats like a glove. Work truck seat covers are tough, durable, denim-weight fabric. It's like putting a pair of rugged jeans on your truck's seats. Want to stay warm? Covercraft also offers seat heaters. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. Are you a Cars Yeah subscriber? If you're not, go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button, and I'll send you my free filler up book. It's a very cool book I created of fuel filler fun, some very cool imagery, and great quotes from past guests here on Cars Yeah. Plus, you'll get my weekly email follow-up and my weekly blog. Just go to carsyeah.com, click on the free book button, and I'll send it to you right away. Thanks for subscribing. Hey, John, welcome to Cars Yeah. Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Yes, I am. Yes, ready to go. Well, have some fun. Well, before we start with some questions I have for you, I have to ask you this. I mean, you worked with those characters at Top Gear. This is a show that virtually everyone knows about who's a car enthusiast. Maybe tell us one little thing, and I'm sure this is hard to come up with because there is no one little thing when it comes to Top Gear, but one little thing about producing Top Gear that maybe people don't know about. Oh, I say that's an interesting one. Uh, I, I, I think it's one of the most important things about the show was what I was trying to do with it when I was producing, which is mainly making it more of a sort of car magazine on television, was just I, the, the thing I wanted to do was to get everybody who was actually on the show enthusiastic about cars above all else. 
And um, that's why I sort of selected some of the presenters I was fortunate enough to be able to introduce uh, to the show in the 90s, people, uh, people like uh, Jeremy Clarkson and uh, uh, Quentin Wilson, our um, historic car man, and Vicky Butler Henderson, who was very uh, an excellent driver. I used to really enjoy trying to select people with the maximum amount of passion. And it was also the same bit behind the screen. We'd, we also tried to get a whole team of researchers who were really just sort of passionate car enthusiasts. We were almost working in television by chance. I think that was the main thing that we, that we were trying to do. I think during that period, we got there and, and actually put some of the foundations together for the show as it later developed in the much more entertainment uh, route in, the, in this current century. That was what I was probably most proud of during that time. Well, you know, it became just this legendary, iconic thing for us car fanatics. Back then, when you started that, did you have any idea what what you were starting to create? I mean, obviously, we go into projects thinking they're going to be successful, but did you have any foresight that, oh, my gosh, look what we've done? Not sufficiently. In fact, I, I remember my, my, my late father used to point out to me that sometimes when I was, I was just sort of buried into producing the show itself. And he said, you, you do realize the last three years you've been there, or three or four years, you've been the most successful program on BBC Two, which was the channel we were on, and uh, way ahead of everything else. And I said, well, actually, I hadn't really got around to thinking about that. So <laughs> I think we were just uh, too busy having fun doing it, really. Although everybody worked very hard, and I'm sure they're absolutely dedicated to it. So one, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, I guess. Um, and no. The other thing. Yeah. The other thing I think was trying to persuade the BBC because they were very they were quite sceptical in the early days. There had been car programs on before, but I think they tended to seem to think that people weren't really that interested in in cars. But it was just strange because they do lots of programs about opera and theatre and music and all lots of wonderful things. But strangely, they never thought cars were quite that common currency that obviously people like you and I know them know they are. Yeah, well, obviously you you got a cast of characters there that gelled. Perfectly. It's kind of like the Seinfeld television show here in the States. Uh, the characters just worked so well together. And if you even do interviews with Jerry Seinfeld and, and the cast, they, that first year they thought, there's no way this is going to continue because, you know, the joke is it was a show about nothing, but it was really a show about those characters. And to me, Top Gear, while there were cars, the cars almost became secondary to the characters. Uh, yes, that in, in 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 later years, I think probably when I when I was there, I think the cars were almost still still first, but it had already started started to happen. And it was in some ways because I think people's attitudes to cars had changed in a way, so it was right. more appropriate that they should become become part of an entertainment uh, thing. Having said that, you both said that, but also the whole now the great thing about cars on television is there's such a huge diversity of programs. Whereas previously, maybe there were there were just a few. Now you more you I mean you can you can watch almost nothing else but programs about classic cars being restored if. if if, if you want to, which which is wonderful that there is, and the more sports stuff available than ever, and more, and, it, and uh, the fact that uh, it's exploded and taken off in that way is brilliant. And there yeah, are all it, the YouTube channels as well, and everything. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah, it's just everywhere. So if you love cars, and and then you've got podcasts like mine and other podcasts mm. about cars, that um, it just yeah, if you love cars, love automobiles, if it rolls on rubber, it's impossible. Now, what's one little thing that perhaps John most people don't know about you? Uh, yeah, that, my my problem with cars is that I love driving slow ones as fast as possible, <laughs> rather 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 than really. <laughs> And I think, uh, and, so, and I have a bit of a weakness for, um, well, I suppose what you might call everyday cars. We have a thing uh, in in Britain at the moment called the Festival of the Unexceptional, which I've been for, well, I've been fortunate to judge <laughs> for the last four years. It's where people spend an awful amount of time and effort cherishing and maybe restoring, what's in some cases now, the only example of some very well, car that was once very popular and is now survives only in, in handfuls or, or something like that. And but they've cherished it and completely restored it and. We, we, we sort of have things like what I mean. I, I think a Nissan Sunny one one year and a, a Chrysler Alpine that was uh, that they that was almost like the last surviving one that they people had recreated the upholstery for and, and gone to incredible lengths and it and it, it is a, a, a wonderful event and it sort of parallels my my weakness with cars, which is I, I just like um, cold bangers really. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. That's cool. Sometimes it's good to slow down and smell the roses and uh, enjoy the ride versus going through the countryside a little too fast. Well, let's start your journey with a success quote or a mantra. This is some kind of saying that has perhaps some meaning to you in your life. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning. And if they're, even if they're turning a little slow, you're on cars, yeah? So, John, take the wheel. 
Oh, well, I think in my case, one thing I would say to anybody more than anyone else is to follow your childhood interests. If you've got some strong childhood interests, which, which uh, just make your career out of them, if possible, because that's what I've been fortunate. Whenever I've diverted and tried to work in an area which isn't to do with cars or technology or something like that, it's never been so much fun. And I think that that, that would probably be my, uh, my, the one thing I could uh, advise people on, really. You know, I think it's a, it's a brilliant thought, and I've seen this concept out there before when we're little children. You know, we're not limited by all the limitations we put on us as we grow up. And so anything is possible. And that's why kids want to be, you know, astronauts and race car drivers mm. and fire truck drivers or oh, indeed. Yeah. whatever. It's just there's not all these limitations. So I think that's a brilliant idea. I've I've mentored and talked with some young people who are trying to find their way in life. And I always say the same thing. Well, what excited you as a child? And Many times that helps steer them in the right direction and find their their course of career or fun in life, if you will. Well, I want to talk a bit about this book that you've written, Autopia, because this is a first for you, Autopia, The Future of Cars, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Now, you've been a writer and you do write, so you know how to pen something, but tell our listeners what they can expect to enjoy when they get their hands on this new book. It's really, I, I set out to try and answer for myself, really, all, all the sort of questions that were occurring to me as to how my hobby was changing, that one of them, this major interest I'd had. It seems after cars, had perhaps, although they obviously changed over the years, they hadn't really had much of a revolution, maybe, but now they seem to be on the brink of this revolution of, of autonomy and different fuels and so on. I, I just wanted to know how that would affect my passion in terms of would I still be able to enjoy classic cars? Would motorsport still continue? What will be powering cars in the future? How, what will they look like? What will, what will their design be? How, how successful will autonomy be? And uh, all, all those, I try to answer all those questions and sort of bring together a lot of thoughts on those, those subjects. Now, do you feel like you did answer some of those questions? Uh, because I, I, I think about what's going on right now with automobiles, and I'm just amazed because this is, I really believe this is a massive revolution that's going on. The change that's occurring and how fast and how different things are going to be it has frightened some people. And, you know, some car guys and gals go, oh, well, I would never want an autonomous car. And then you think about elderly people or the blind or people that are disabled that would like to still go out and do things, but they're limited. But if they could ring up a car that could just drive up and take them to the doctor or the store or the theater or, or on a beautiful drive where they could sit back and enjoy yeah. the English countryside. So it's fascinating to me. Were there any big surprises? prizes that you uncovered that you really didn't think you would uncover when you were writing the book? I think actually one of the most heartening things was to to realize just how um, how good the future is for classic cars in some way in in some ways in the sense that technology is actually is helping in terms of 3D printing that we can now get so many parts for old cars remade and all, and, and uh, that's a very positive thing and also they've had a lot of manufacturers now getting into uh, supporting their heritage as well is also quite positive I feel well, we could even have a sort of a synthetic fuel for a lot of classic cars as well if if the world does change massively uh, in terms of n there not being enough filling stations to, to keep your car on the road. I think it's still, um, there, there's usually a positive solution to virtually um, virtually any problem. And and those solutions are happening and providing there's the interest in the cars, which I think there is going to be because I think it's an increasingly global interest in, in classic cars. I mean, there's a huge following in China, for example, for, for classic, which they're currently they're not allowed to import, but uh, that may change in the decades ahead. So I, I, I see a very positive future for classic. Autonomy, I think, will probably be a little slower than some of us have e either feared or thought. Uh, I, I think it's got it's tremendously positively think as well. I think it's a real challenge for artificial intelligence, and I think we're going to see it very much in very controlled areas first, in uh, university campuses, retirement communities, and so on. You know, that, that's where... And, Pods going about very slowly is how you're most likely to encounter a, uh, a, an autonomous car first. Although having said that, there's also that wonderful prospect of the very controlled environment of the racetrack and Lewis Hamilton teaching you how to drive your Mercedes in virtual form and showing you the lines. And then you, which I, which I still think is a very positive and very real and very feasible development to happen in the, in the short term. Absolutely. I have a second podcast that I do with the publisher of Sports Car Market Magazine, Keith Martin. It's titled Buy, Sell, Hold. And the concept behind it is to talk with people who invest in classic cars, sell, buy classic cars, auction classic cars. And one of the guests we had said something interesting to me that what you just said triggered that thought. He said, think back when the horse was the main transportation. Mm. 
And cars were coming along, and a lot of people laughed at the cars. They said, why would you want that? There's no roads for them. They can't go where horses can go. This is silly. Well, horses now have not gone away. They still exist, but they're used as purely entertainment, really, for the joy mm. of riding or for racing, um, whatever it might be. And his thought was that in the future, uh, cars as we know them now and classic cars will be the same thing. They'll only mm. be used in specific enjoyment events, maybe driven on tracks, maybe special roads, uh, that kind of thing. So it evolves over time. It may be a long time before that happens, but when you think about it, um, I really hope that classic cars don't mm. go away and we can still no, I, use them. But it's an interesting it, thought, isn't it? And, and, and also, that they, that it's, they'll, they'll be, once they occupy that niche, as it were, you no longer feel you need to feel guilty about using them and all these other concerns sort of disappear. And there's sort of an, yes. al an analogy with old-fashioned photography and that the analog photography goes back in the 80s and 90s. People were genuinely worried. Everyone was taking photographs around the world. We only had a limited supply of silver and there were all these chemicals involved in, in photo processing. And, uh, you know, there was a thought we'd run out of the silver. Yes. And then, first of all, but then digital photography came along. Um, people take more photos than ever. They don't have to worry about uh, the depletion of, of silver. But at the same time, now there's a thriving uh, niche in old-fashioned analog photography. So you can take your old film camera out and do make your prints be, and uh, and you don't have to worry about the uh, about the consequences on raw materials or anything like that. So it's, uh, I think, um, real grounds for optimism for the future of cars, in spite of the fact we can easily feel, you know, the, the, the pressures on us that we're contributing too much to global warming or whatever like that. But of course, if everybody's driving alternative fuel cars, you, you don't need to feel guilty anymore about taking out your old V8. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. it's just like if your horse poops on the street, you don't have to feel guilty. Yeah. About, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Well, John, let's take a look at uh, some challenges or a challenge or maybe even a failure you face along the way. If you want to relate it to your book, Autopia, that is absolutely fine. And in that respect, I would ask you, what were some of the great challenges you faced in writing this book? Uh, was it the research side or were there other things that kind of surprised you that made it a challenge to create this book? Oh, it, it, it uh, I, I suppose in terms of the book's challenge, it was actually just, uh, all the constant questions that kept occurring to me. Oh, I've got to answer this. I've got to answer that. It was, try, it was the difficulty of not of uh, trying not to make it too comprehensive, in a sense. Uh, that was, uh, and 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 I know my publisher was keen that I should ration myself and make it concise and keep the um, and keep it reasonably punchy and get get the messages through. But I was, oh gosh, I haven't thought of that. You know, I haven't thought. Should cars be listed? Do I need to? Uh, do, which which to some extent has started to happen in America, hasn't it? With the uh, you know the, the original bullet Mustang and so on is on the oh, yeah. on that register. Whether it yes. doesn't actually confer any statutory protection i don't think for the car but nevertheless it's uh, it's great that this list is being compiled of cars that almost become like works of art rather than manufactured but i mean that's all that, that was one of my main concerns but uh, i suppose in terms of other aspects of life i, I think when, when i got a bit in, when I was working for the BBC, I got a bit diverted into management rather than away from programmes, and I uh, and I, I found that less success. I found that very didn't suit me at all. So I had to sort of stop doing that, and I said, you know, I had to think back of what I do best and what I've achieved, and uh, and uh, who have I worked with, and start and sort of rethink what you were capable of, which was, which immediately started leading to other things. So that was fine. But I, uh, if, if that's a sort of positive lesson, I think that come out of the out, out of a difficult period. Yeah. Well, it's not so. Un common, I think a lot of people go to work with companies and they want to advance. And of course, they want to earn more income. And when they start moving up that corporate ladder, all of a sudden they find themselves in these roles that they go, this is a much fun. And, <laughs> yes. You know, I always yes. say that to people that complain about, uh, say, let's say CEOs that make huge sums of money. And I said, well, go try to do that job. You see what kind of pressures are on you. If you think about world conditions today, the pressures on our leaders around the world uh, to deal with things. I can't even imagine how they go to sleep at night. I mean, you know, I mean, most people are too worried about getting enough toilet paper. Uh, but think about uh, protecting the world uh, from mayhem. Uh, it's pretty incredible. So, yeah, sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for, right? Uh, yes. Well, that's true. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a short break. We're going to thank our sponsors here and we'll be right back. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for the enthusiast and the collector. It's your monthly must-read whether you dream of owning a collector car, have two cars, or 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years, and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, 
and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Plus, you'll get the exclusive SEM guide to restoration shops included for free. At checkout, use the code CARSYEAH and receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription. It's an exclusive offer from me here at Cars Yeah. I'm Mark Green, and I love Sports Car Market Magazine. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at com or connect with me through the Cars yeah website at com. If you're listening to Cars yeah, you've probably spent some time working on your favorite ride. But how confident are you working on your finances? You may be able to rebuild a fuel injection system, but can you decipher the details of a mutual fund? If you're like me, investments, insurance, annuities, budgeting, and other financial concepts may seem a bit daunting, but what if I told you there's a book that describes these subjects and more in an easy-to-read and a very humorous way? My friend Chris Kimball, CFP, a longtime sponsor and past guest here on Cars yeah, has written that book, and it's titled The Saga of Ike and Penny, a couple's humorous journey through the confusing world of finance. It's a fun look at things you need to know, everything from investing to effective ways to get rid of credit card debt, and it's probably the only book on finance with a VMAX on the front cover and a classic Mini Cooper on the back. The book's available at Amazon for just $10, and this book will dramatically improve the direction of your financial future. I gave copies to each of my children. All securities are through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Christopher Kimball Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Get your copy, The Saga of Ike and Penny, today. All right, John, we are back. And I would love for you to share a story with me that instigated your personal passion for cars. Is there a pivotal moment in your life when you look back that you knew you were indeed going to be a car guy? I, actually, I can't think of a time when I when when I wasn't. I, even when I was uh, about two or three, I, I was definitely uh, collecting car brochures. I think by by, by that age, I, I can remember drawing. Um, this didn't go down terribly well. I was drawing um, a, a lot of dashboards all over my parents' wedding pictures in their album. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so that that was that was uh, and uh, and, and uh, actually all the time I was in school, I kept on collecting the brochures. I accumulated thousands of them. I still haven't had the heart to get rid of them. Actually, you know, you used oh, to. Gosh. Used to ring up the importers and so on, and um, yeah. uh, feign an interest in the. Well, I was, I was genuinely interested, but uh, I certainly wasn't able to buy the late the new Lamborghini or whatever it was. And they always very kindly used to send the brochures, which I which I still got. Yeah, oh, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. I think you know we all collected those as kids. My dad, I remember when he took me to the Porsche dealership in San Diego, and they had the first Porsche 911, and it was just like, oh my gosh, this is so different and so unique, and the salesman. I still have it. He gave me a copy of that brochure and I thought, I think I was only, this was 64, 65. So I was only about seven years old, something like that. So, but I just thought, wow, he gave me that. That is so cool. And uh, yeah, I still have it in my files. I just can't let it go, but uh, very cool. Well, how about your first special vehicle? Is there a first car in your life that had great meaning for you and maybe share a memory you have about that? Oh, I mean, my, my first car, I always have a love, slightly love-hate relationship with it, because I've still got it, which is just a, a, a Volkswagen Beetle, which, I, which I've actually rebuilt a couple of times. But I, and I suppose in the sense that, I've, I've, that uh, cause my, uh, my parents have bought it, I used to hate it when they, when they first bought it, because uh, it replaced something much more exciting. Uh, but, I took it, I, but I started using it when I went to college and got very fond of it, actually. And, uh, and I used to end, uh, and when I, was, well, I used to briefly work for Ford after I left, after I left university, and I, I've kept it, uh, and, and it was always slightly, slightly annoyed them on the car park at uh, Ford that I had this ancient uh, rust, <laughs> rust, rusting big land. What year so, was that Beetle? 72. Oh, uh, 72. Yeah. It's very, very, it was all full 34 horsepower. That was, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I can, you can still get leaded petrol for them in the UK. So I, which it's, which it theoretically doesn't need, but it doesn't run better on it. When you've only got 34 horsepower, it's, uh, you really do need all the help you can get. So, uh, that's probably where my love of, uh, being able to drive car, uh, 
slow cars flat out all the time that uh, has, uh, uh, comes from in, in a sense. But I said you won't, it wouldn't really constitute a special car. I think a special car, well, it does in some respect, but they, uh, they, it, uh, I think that my first experience with special cars when I started working as, as on the on the car program was being able to drive some of my first supercars of the of the era in the eighties. You know, I remember, remember being slightly disappointed by my Lamborghini Countach that I got to drive because the sheer the sheer effort required to get from A to B was uh, <laughs> yes. Control. And I, that had disappointed me slightly. Although the test roster that we had on test at the same time, I remember I, um, it was felt much more like the future. I can recall so I've got a lot of early experiences of cars like that. And again, then again, back at the BBC, you had to persuade your bosses to do be able to do an item like that because they thought nobody was ever interested in uh, you know oh, how could gosh. our viewers have any interest. But uh, I ultimately won the day by persuading them that it was far more um, uh, equable, if you like, to suggest that everybody could dream about owning a Ferrari or Lamborghini than it was that everybody could afford to buy a new uh, uh, Ford Escort or something like that. So right. uh, that's the justification for having that. Uh, that those on the uh, on on the screen, I, but uh, but I can remember the, the drive to the location in the um, in the Countach was quite a lot of effort. But I did manage to get the side shot, which I think was which I wanted with the two red cars going through uh, green grass on the airfield, which was because uh, I'd seen it in on, on the copy of Car Magazine at the time that they'd had that a similar shot, and I wanted to try and get that in motion, as it were, the, the moving equivalent of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, thinking back to all those years. You guys were testing and having fun with those cars. I would assume you got to jump in some of those and and give them maybe a little ride. Is there one that really stood out for you that when you got out of it, you just couldn't stop thinking about it? Actually, one of the best best ones was the first. Cause I'd, I'd had a bit of a a bit of a love hate relationship with nine elevens as well. I'd, but uh, but it was when I think it was the nine six four Porsche came out uh, uh-huh. eighty nine eighty nine the first Carrera four. Yep. And I, uh-huh. remember going, I remember going to Stuttgart to pick it up for some filming. I just really enjoyed it. And this was a 911 that I would really want, I felt. And I, oh, that, yeah. that, is a, uh, that was quite a momentous filming trip, I recall. Yeah. Well, the 964, yeah, those were really revolutionary in many ways. And when you think back, that first four-wheel drive, I mean, it became the norm for so many cars in the future. I had a 4S uh, later on um, after that car that really came out of that. The 959, of course, a lot of technology mm. out of that car in the same era. Uh, went forward into most of the Porsches later, turbocharging, twin turbocharging, and so forth. So that's very interesting to hear that. Well, here's a very introspective question for you, John. If you woke up tomorrow and you were manifested as a vehicle, <laughs> what what would John Bentley be? Ah, that's, I, I used to always imagine myself as a, as a car as a child, actually. Okay. Really? Uh, but uh, strangely, okay. in a way. But no, but I don't think it's the car I would choose. Uh, and then I, it was... It was more of a commercial vehicle, I imagine myself. But the, but the uh, I think the car probably would be I mean, probably a Rover P6. I think in the sense it probably needs to be British in a way, and it probably needs to be a bit understated because I'm not don't have don't think I'm particularly have a particularly large ego. So, but at the same time, I think it's reasonably capable, considered and well designed. Do you, are you familiar with the Rover 2006, the 1963? Well, it's a very unique car. Yeah, the P6. I know the car you're talking about. They never really imported them here to the states, so. It's not a car that I think very many people would ever see, but it's, to me, it's a very, how could I just, God, I'm trying to think how I could describe that car. There's something about that car that you love, but something is off a little bit. And, and I don't mean to say that <laughs> yeah. about you, John, of course. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you may be being very perceptive. Yeah. That, that came across terrible, didn't it? Boy, yep. and, and that was the end of the conversation I had with John Bentley. He, he hung up and he left. No, there's something about the car, and I think it's the way the front end, if I remember the model right, the way it drops away, it, it's almost like, to me, it almost looked from a profile, looked like a Ford Fairlane or something from the 60s, because I don't know, it just, there's something, there's something quaint about it, but there's always some, there's also something to me that's a little bit off about it. But w- w- let me ask you this before I keep putting my foot in my mouth. What do you like about the car well, I like, that, you, I, I, that you relate to it? <laughs> I, I suppose I like the fact that it's, it, it, it's both very, very conservative and in some ways quite radical un, underneath for its time in terms of the engineering structure and the safety uh, abilities of it. And I, I think the styling was supposedly inspired by the Citroen DS in a way. In a well, there you go. There you go. That makes that. sense. Yeah, because it, it kind of swoops. There's a little bit of an element of it wanting to swoop down or something. I, I, I don't know. It just, it's so different to me. 
but I didn't realize that there was some ramp. What are some of the the elements of it that were revolutionary in a way? I think, well, it's the, I, I, I think with the 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 strength of the bodywork in crashes was very good. The design of the interior was likewise. It, it was also more the fact that it's, um, it was it was it pioneered the sort of small executive car movement. It was the whole idea that um, ah. uh, that uh, that a car didn't have to be huge to be prestigious in a way that it could be there could be a compact um uh-huh. it's sort of pre predated or the BMW 3 series the uh, that that sort of genre of uh, yeah uh, okay i can see uh, that yeah, yeah. It, it had it had uh three kind of cool scoops on the hood too didn't it uh, some of them did yes yeah, um, some of them. okay tc maybe then it, then they, then they became the versions with the v8 with the buick derived v8 uh, engine the three and a half with the, but but they did, haven't got quite well, actually, the early ones did retain the purity of the styling, so maybe, maybe that would be the, the one of the very first three and a half liter ones would probably might well be the one to go for. Yeah, well, yeah, with that British V8, and I think it was Bill Wardlow was the ah. was he the, was he. I'm trying to think who designed that car. You're the first Rover P6 on the show, so All right. that, <laughs> that makes you very unique. Um, actually, I think the designers. I was looking it up here. They King, did. King, oh, and they, Bashford and yeah. uh, Bosch. If you say his name right, Bach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're the designers of that car. So, uh, yeah, very cool. And they made some of those uh, also down in New Zealand, I believe, or were they all from that they, area? I, I, I don't know. I suppose they could have exported them some in lockdown form, I guess. But uh, yeah. there's, uh, I mean, they, they do appear in the old film. Uh, there's one in, in Gattaca, right? I think, they're where they're turbine powered. But that's. Uh, oh, really? Wow. Yes. And uh, well, that's that sort of cool. vision of a, uh, a future where we can choose our genetics. They've got, they've got all got a Buick Riviera and that and a few, a few other things if you're into car spotting in, uh, in yeah. movies. But uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, you know, you're a unique guy. So I think that's a good fit. So definitely the, the first. <laughs> Out of 1,522 people here on Cars, yeah, you're the first Rover P6. So you listeners out there that aren't familiar with that car, uh, Google that and check it out. You'll see some very unique to style and design elements on that car. Uh, and I love the ones with the three scoops on the hood. That's pretty darn cool. Kind of a hot rod version, I guess you could call that. All right, John, we are entering what I call the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of that Rover P6 throttle. So. Here we go. Would you share one of your personal habits that you think has contributed to some of your successes over the years? Oh, I think I'm quite good at spotting talent. I think that that's one thing, uh, and predicting how people are going to behave and when they're going to be good. So that uh, ah. and, uh, and uh, I got the chance to exercise that quite a bit, in, certainly in the in the car area. I think. Oh so. yeah, absolutely. The elements of a uh, very good producer for sure, and uh, you definitely spotted some great talent when uh, it goes to the BBC's Top Gear show for sure. Nice job there. How about if I could arrange for you to sit down and have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased? Who would it be? I'd want to meet um, one or at least one of those uh, wonderful stylists from the, the, the American car industry of the 50s and uh, mm. who were, were, so, were so obsessed with the space. I was a, a Harley Earl, perhaps, or possibly a yes. virtual X. So I'd probably just go for Harley Earl. Yeah, mm. oh, that'd be fantastic. How about the best automotive advice someone's ever given you? Well, that was uh, from one of my uh, presenters on, on on Top Gear. It was T- Tiffany Dell, who's a bit of a uh, uh, racing driver, and he said, uh, "If you find yourself in a bad position when you're about to have a crash, look where you want to go rather than what you're about to hit." <laughs> yes, and uh, that's advice. been ve- that's been very useful for me on at least a couple of occasions when you know people have just driven out in front of you or from a turning or whatever. Ah! And it, yeah. it, it's helped. No, it's a great piece of advice. It's something they definitely teach you in racing school. Uh, ah. Look, Yeah, look where you want to go, not where you, where you're going. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that'll help you steer into the right place. How about a great resource that you tap into on a regular basis? Is there one out there you'd like to share? I love looking at the work of great car photographers, actually. That's, uh, I think, a wonderful thing, a resource to look at. I like uh, that Amy Shaw's quite good uh, on her website, uh, and she manages to get a very not great look of classic car photography with involving people quite a lot. I like that. And also by, by a chap I recruited many years ago onto Top Gear, who went to Richard Porter, who had his splendid website, sniffpetrol.com, so if you want something. Bit, bit, quite amusing, a, a sort of a, a tangential, amusing look at cars. That's quite there good. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll remind our listeners, there are hundreds of automotive photographers that I've interviewed here on Cars Yeah. You can just go to com, type or click on the resources tab, and you'll see the photographers listed some very, very talented people that you can go and 
Uh, find their show notes page. I've got links back to their websites. Some really, really fantastic photographers. Now, John, I always ask my guests about a book. Now, obviously, the book that we want to let people know about is your new book, Autopia, The Future of Cars. But is there perhaps maybe another book that you'd like to recommend that you've enjoyed? Well, it's a very well. It's rather eccentric choice, actually. It, 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 when I was about ten, I found in a second-hand bookshop a book called "Round England in an Eight-Pound Car," which was a bloke who who wanted to write wanted to drive around England in a car that cost him no more than the price of a coat. <laughs> and uh, I was frankly, I was a bit bored by it when I first read it. When I went at age ten, but I re- reread it recently, and it just is such a wonderful, affectionate portrait, both of a, a country, a sort of part, a, a world that disappeared in some senses, but 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 also of a a, a man's relationship with a very ordinary car and how he cherishes it round on a very long, long trip and then can hardly bear to part with it at the end, which um, is uh, it's sort of a very quite quite an emotional read and it just shows the, the relationship you can build up with a car, even one that's very, very cheap. Fantastic. I've not heard of that. So I would assume people probably need to go to like eBay or use bookstores or yes. online, yeah, to find a copy of that. Wow. Yeah, I'll have to find that. That's interesting. I've not, never heard of that book. Round England in an eight pound car. First, I thought you meant how could a car only weigh eight pounds? But of course you, have, <laughs> you have that silly money over there. Yeah, so, that's funny uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, the funny stuff. There you go. Well, listen, we are up to the checkered flag, and this last question can be a bit of a doozy. I'm going to buy you a very cool car today, John. Any collector car you'd like to own, I will park it in your garage. But you have to abide by a couple of my rules. One is you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys with. You have to drive it. I would like you to enjoy this vehicle. But it's the only one cool collector car you can have. So. Choose wisely, my friend. Mm, I, I, it's interesting. One, I'd, I'd, I'd be very tempted by a, a car I drove for the first time last year that I'd always intended to drive uh, and never got round to it, which was the Alpha SZ. It's like a bit of brutalist architecture, but in car form and with that wonderful uh, Busso engine and uh, with, uh, with the V6. But I'm not sure. I, at the same time, I'm, I almost think I might. Uh, go down. What I would really like to do, because I have a tendency myself to buy a car and never ever get rid of it and keep it for ages. Uh, I'd, I'd almost like to, to to get a new one and use it every day and grow into it. And I was tempted. To, one, I drove last year also an Audi R8 in the V10 form, which I found a very usable supercar-ish sort of car. Yeah. So that would be very tempting. But I wouldn't want to say yes until I, which I stupidly perhaps haven't driven yet, uh, uh, but I'd at least tried the current Alpine A110, which is uh, such a, a beautifully a very, a very tactile and enjoyable car. But uh, so I'd probably go with the Audi, okay. and uh, uh, but then with that qualification that I'd want to try the A110 first. Okay. Well, we can, we can arrange for that. No worries. No worries. <laughs> I'll send both cars over for you oh, to uh, you. drive. Drive out into the English countryside, and then you can choose what you want. You just, you just let me know. How's that sound? Uh, sounds, sounds great to me, yes. Yeah, Any it sounds... Drive them again, in the case the, of the Audi, and then the first time in the case of the LP. There you go. There you go. Yeah, when that R8 first came out, I was at uh, Miller Motorsport Park in Utah for some races, and uh, Audi brought some cars out, and they let us drive them around, and it, it, it was marvelous. Uh, I just really... This was the first version, but it was really, really an enjoyable car to drive, so... uh I think that might be a great choice. John, you've taken us on a great ride today. This has been great fun. Thank you for calling in and sharing your journey and sharing this new book that you've written titled Autopia, The Future of Cars by John Bentley. I'll remind our listeners, if you would like to get your name in the hat to win a copy of this that John is going to be so kind to send you, just go to carsyad.com, click on the free book button. I'll send you my ebook titled Filler Up, and your name will be in the hat. Before I let you go, would you offer our listeners maybe one little pearl of wisdom before you drive off into the sunset in that new Audi R8? One of my minor regrets in life is actually not taking enough pictures. Um, and I know we're all taking pictures seemingly all the time now, but I, I think I think take more and more, take lots and lots of pictures of your cars. It, it always will come in, they'll come in useful and uh, as, to jog memories and, uh, and and keep them alive in your mind. So even, even just take extra pictures, whether it's with a camera or the phone or whatever. Absolutely, no, it's a great idea. And, and nowadays, boy, mm. you think about if our parents had the ability to take the photographs and videos that we can do today on these these wonderful little mobile devices kind of history that we would have. And you think about children born today or even in the last 10 years, their whole life's going to be documented in a way that we've never seen before. So yeah, take more pictures. 
And again, if you can't wait to get a copy or maybe win a copy of John's book, I'll make sure I put links on the Cars yeah website where you can go and make, a, I'll make it so it's a quick, easy click to buy. Get your hands on this new book, Autopia, The Future of Cars by John Bentley. I think you're going to really enjoy this. John, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise. You are such a delight. Until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you down the road. Thank you. It's been great fun. You're welcome. Hey, Cars Yeah listeners, this is Mark Green. If you love the Cars Yeah podcast, I have something new for you. I've teamed up with Keith Martin, a collector car market expert and the editor of Sports Car Market Magazine to create the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast. Buy, Sell, Hold is the essence of collecting. Together, we take you on an educational ride into the collector car market, talking with industry experts, helping you navigate your collector car journey so you know when to buy, sell, hold. We talk with seasoned experts, who buy, sell, and hold investment vehicles, and they'll share their insider secrets on how they make their buying decisions when it comes to making these important investments. You'll find the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast on the Cars Yeah website, on the Sports Car Market website, and if you're a podcast app subscriber to Cars Yeah, Buy, Sell, Hold will come right to your mobile device, just like the Cars Yeah podcast, automatically. Join Keith Martin and me on a great new venture on the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah. Yeah.